So giving you a little background as to where I'm coming from, when I studied landscape architecture at UC Davis, I came away with a, a pretty strong background in California natives. They have a fabulous arboretum on campus. And I went right to work for a landscape architect, nurseryman, contractor in Auburn uh, back in 1981. And I started to, in the design work I was doing, I started specifying natives, but I got admonished for the fact that it was very difficult to find them and actually nearly impossible to find natives at that point in time. Nobody grew them. Um, it wasn't till much later, probably 10 or 15 years later that some of the wholesale nurseries around here like Cornflower Farms uh, started uh, to come on the scene. So for many, many years, uh, never never utilized natives. And it's one of the things that I'm really delighted to be able to come back to because of why I went into landscape architecture to help heal the planet, not make it make things worse. So I think most of us are aware of how much European settlement has changed um, the whole nature and face of California. Very little habitat remains unaltered here. And what's really scary is that the land conversion rate is that of roughly one football field every two and a half minutes. And this is tremendously affecting the population of native species, not only plants, but everything that relies on them. That's because native plants are a cornerstone of all the biological diversity that we see. Um, the ever increasing destruction and fragmentation is creating what we call an ecological Armageddon. And I mean, it is, we will see with some of the numbers um, that it's getting quite, no, I mean, it's getting bad. So. If we can reverse this relationship that we have with nature and try to embrace it more, we can turn this around. So our efforts individually can really help make a difference um, by restoring nature to our own gardens and other spaces around us. We can help provide more connectivity and habitat again um, to help repair things. And selecting the right natives for our garden is really what will help bring that needed change one garden at a time. It makes a difference. California is really unique in that we have over 36 bio, we're, we're one of 36 biodiversity hotspots in the world and the only one in North America. Um, and we're only one, uh, one of five areas with a Mediterranean climate. And we know all too well the hot, dry summers, which we're experiencing now is particularly dry, and our cool, wet winters, which seem to be getting shorter, less cool, and, and less wet. So these 10 bioregions, uh, how, this is how the state is broken up into these 10 bioregions, um, house just a huge variety of wildlife species, as you can see. 61% of 3,500 different species are found nowhere else in the world other than our state. And we are, have a unique variety of plant genre, genera, of which 2,100 species of plants have actually evolved here in our state. And right now, less than 24% of all endangered plants and animals in the United States alone are here in California. So and in an article written by Chris Clark back in 2016, that was where it was noted at this habitat loss of, of football fields worth of habitat. Um, of 11 Western states that were studied, California is really losing uh, habitat much faster equivalent to that as an area that if you combined Los Angeles counties and San Diego's together, that's what was lost at any one particular point in time. I mean, it's just, and it's not slowing down. There's not enough nature remaining um, to generate the natural capital 
our wildlife depends on. Um, if you think about the fact that it's disappearing faster than we can actually do restoration, um, that's not a good thing. So these floristic provinces are pretty much, it's another way to think of regions, um, but once covered almost the entire state and now less than 25% of that vegetation remains statewide. A lot of this habitat loss is due to harvesting of natural resources, um, both in terms of developing agriculture and then for mining, uh, logging, pumping oil out of the earth, you know, for minerals. I mean, we can go back to, uh, especially to gold rush days. You see both the devastation here in this photo, the black and white photo, the total destruction of not only uh, habitat, but uh, just leave the environmental damage that was done still is seen today. Urbanization is also another key factor in habitat loss. Um, the development of subdivisions and for housing people, and whether it's in cities or in more rural areas, they're both destructive. And then in addition to that are fires, insect infestations such as beetle damage. Um, air pollution itself uh, has a tremendous impact on trees um, and can kill them. And then invasive species outcompete and displace natives. And again, uh, it, particularly in the Sierra Nevada where we live, only 25% of natural habitat remains. Our for a lot of the forests that have been logged are replaced with other species of trees. It's not that they're allowed to come back and grow naturally. They're planting other species for the purpose of, again, cutting them down like an agricultural crop. We're also the most hydrologically altered landmass on the planet. Um, the whole entire Sacramento Valley has been altered way beyond what it ever used to be in terms of it was all mostly riparian uh, habitat and marsh, uh, you know, freshwater marshes at one point in time. So you can see that very little habitat remains, less than 1% with riparian woodlands and all the rest. The, and our wetlands in themselves have fared so far the best, but, and yet there's still only 50% of those left in their natural state. And with all that habitat loss, we're losing more species of animals as well. And in particular, bird species. Um, Audubon has documented over 600 species in, in Northern California or in North America. And the 600, or excuse me, the 600 species found in California make up two thirds of all the birds in Northern California. That, so we've got the majority of those birds here in this state, but they are being impacted tremendously, their populations. Um, and then also in taking a look at our, the variety of um, mammals that we have and reptiles as well. So the conversion of natural habitat has really caught impacting species and has already caused um, extinctions. And it's that's that's stepping up, and it, the rate of that is increasing. Uh, the conversion of habitat is happening faster in areas uh, in the coastal areas and the low lying areas, particularly Sacramento Valley, uh, than it is here in the foothills. But it's still being impacted here as well. I mentioned an apocalypse or an Armageddon. And this is really pretty much starting with the fact that insects are uh, disappearing and the populations have decreased 75 to 82% over the last 27 years um, and globally 40% wide. And this was documented by Dr. Shapiro out of UC Davis. And he attributes this 
a tremendous loss of insect populations to pesticides, loss of habitat, disease, climate change, et cetera. Um, and that's something again, where as we can look at our own homes, our own yards, we can at least have an impact on, on bringing some of this back. Uh, in California alone, we've um, lost up to 40% of the insects. I don't know about you, but I can remember driving through the Sacramento Valley and you'd have to stop more often to clean your windshield than you did for gas. That's not true anymore. You can drive to LA, from here to LA and hardly have one bug splat. I mean, just think about that. Um, the human driven losses and especially for butterflies and bees and beetles are tremendous impacts. Um, they've shown that there's been a mean uh, decline of 45% over populations that they've been monitoring. And these declines are what are resulting in this decline in bird populations because the majority of birds eat insects at some point in their life cycle. And also the, these declines are affecting um, plant abundance because of pollinators, the pollinator declines and affecting uh, flowering times. And some of that is also affected by climate change, but we're really not talking about that as one of the big factors in this. Um, for instance, I think we're most all aware of the decline in Western monarch butterflies. And again, that is pointed to uh, in terms of habitat loss and pesticide use are the primary factors uh, for that. So why should we care? I mean, especially for insects, most people go bugs, ugh, I just want them out of here. Um, it's discouraging to see the number of people uh, subscribing to pesticide services to take care of things that nature could do for us. Insects are actually the biological foundation for all terrestrial ecosystems. They recycle, they cycle nutrients in the soil in particular. Uh, we know they pollinate plants, disperse seeds. Beneficial insects and what we call natural predators help control populations of other organisms, particularly pests. And they are a major food source for birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. So our actions don't only impact us, but they impact the much broader ecosystems around us. But again, it is reversible on smaller scales as we participate locally. So if we can go beyond the idea that nature should be saved where it remains and include those places where we live, work, learn, play, et cetera, and coexist with nature rather than fighting it, we can have an impact on whether we succeed or fail at this. Giving up isn't an option. I mean, not if you care about not only our life, the quality of our life, but those of our children and our grandchildren and those to come. Destroying the biosphere isn't an option. Um, and public preserves, I know a lot of people point to it, well, we have all this pu these public lands, national forests, parks, et cetera. These are not sufficient enough to sustain the biodiversity that wildlife depends on. Um, our, and then we also have all of the legislation that has occurred in terms of environmental quality acts and all the rest. And again, those are only doing so much. They have helped, they can document populations that have been brought back from the brink, but still the insects, the birds and, and various species are disappearing at a faster rate than are being saved. So we really need to abandon that whole notion that nature's somewhere else and that we really can't help. And that we need, uh, need to base it on a new conservation model, one that sustains the living systems that we all need. So just looking at California, it's really quite amazing to, to think that 
really 45% of our state is actually owned by federal, the federal government. And so most of that land is held in preservation to some degree. However, it can still be mined, grazed, logged, drilled, whatever, developed for solar energy. And when they, every time they do that, that impacts the quality and amount of habitat that remains intact. And then the California State Parks manages another 1.4 million acres in state parks, uh, preserves, wildlands, um, et cetera. And in 1970, thank goodness, um, the National Environmental uh, Policy Act was enacted and it really set us up for kind of putting the brakes on development and the way it was done in a way that now has definitely improved the quality of the air and water and particularly because our own state has even stricter regulations. Um, anyone again, who's grown up in this state or lived in more uh, developed areas. I grew up in Southern California. I remember when my lungs would hurt from the smog. I mean, and that's pretty much doesn't happen anymore unless we get really bad fires. Um, and it gave the public a greater voice in, in the decisions that were being made, not only in government, but with local development. All these other acts came, uh, were a result of that previous legislation in 1970 and have helped improve things as well. So our old assumptions of biolo biological conservation pretty much are, are relying on the experts um, in terms of leave the conservation to conservationists and, and a lot of us send our money to various organizations in hopes that that will, that will help. But again, it's not, it's really not su if, um, sufficient at all. It, we're falling behind. We all depend on our ecosystem to survive and for our continued existence. And each one of us should be carrying the responsibility for good stewardship. And if we make conservation of resources uh, part of our priority, it's going to benefit us all. Again, as I mentioned, little habitat remains undisturbed, not only on the planet, but particularly in California where we live. And what does remain is very fragmented. If I go back to that, if I went back to that map, which I'm not going to do, um, you see, well, I am gonna do that. You look at this map of the federal properties and you see spaces, lots of spaces in that. And that breaks up habitat. And that fragmentation, what it does is it breaks up populations. I apologize for my internet. I hope you're getting this. So the hab habitat population results in these populations of species becoming more vulnerable to extinction because often they require a larger home range. And as that gets fragmented, they don't have that. And so they, therefore they can't continue breeding. Um, and our parks and preserves are just not large enough in some instances to, to do that for them. So we need to look at having restoration also happen on private properties. Now there are a lot of farmers and ranchers out there getting involved in this process through the uh, natural resource conservation districts and uh, doing their part to put in uh, hedgerows and that to improve the conditions and for, especially for pollinators. We need to also look to our local uh, governments and our corporations who have usually much larger uh, property holdings, but where we can help is at our homes. Providing what we can provide is links and patches that enhance the wild areas out there and provide those connections to build, to make these corridors and connections larger between the spaces. Um, and that reduces the vulnerability of these populations, especially to extinction. 
So restoring um, habitat and integrity, in ecological integrity creates more effective biological corridors. So the single biggest thing we can do is to, to actually stop this decline of species in our ecosystems, which will reverse the loss of species, provide stronger, more stable, and more productive ecosystems. And in some cases, they are seeing where they have been doing restoration, you, they're starting to see a return of species that haven't been seen. But we need a lot more people involved to, to help, with, help do this. So we know, again, parks and preserves are not sufficient. They're not large enough. Um, we can't ignore all the other property outside of publicly owned property in terms of helping to connect to these biological corridors and expanding the habitat. I really admire Robin Wall Kimmer, who is a Native American. Uh, she's also a wildlife biologist. Uh, you may know her from her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. Native American populations have, and tribal people have a much different attitude in terms of stewardship um, in their culture than most European based or other cultures have had. And this is one of, I, I love this quote, we need acts of restoration, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands, but for our relationship to the world. There is a relatively new initiative within California called the California Biodiversity Collaborative, um, also known as the 3030 Initiative to conserve 30% of the land and coastal waters in this state by 2030. And they're bringing all kinds of government agencies, but plus tribal groups, the agricultural community, and, and of course business leaders and community leaders are all folded into this in order to um, survey what's left and then prioritize where they put their efforts. And where, again, if you're involved in the iNaturalist program, um, that will help. You can become a part of this in terms of working uh, within this initiative to help in these surveys. All these agencies are also folded in, which is great because the last thing we need is one agency over here doing one thing and focusing on preserving and, and enhancing habitat while another one's over here undoing it all. So with homegrown habitat, we can participate in this at home to provide that connectivity, to expand habitat, um, and provide a way for us to interact on a personal level in a way that we can enjoy it all year long. And this is, the, the photo here is my own yard and that's all natives in the foreground. My edible garden is behind that, but this is only two years old. So it can happen relatively quickly. And the populations of pollinators in this area alone is off the charts. So while we can't affect the crossings where we can affect the habitat and have a, have a part in restoring habitat is becoming a stepping stone or a patch in this network. And where can we find the space to do this? If you already have a yard that's landscaped you can look at kind of what's there and evaluate where you have room to make changes. And one of those is especially what we can point to is the lawn because the lawn is the worst at delivering e ecosystem services. Essentially lawns are ecological deserts because they don't provide support for wildlife. And yet it's the default plant within most people's landscapes. So turf, non-native trees and non-native shrubs, also referred to as introduced uh, 
plant material is what we see around most homes throughout California. Uh, there is a lot of lawn across in America and in particularly in California, roughly I think they estimate almost six and a half million, excuse me, 650,000 acres. Um, with, that was back in 2020,000. 20, 20, I'm sure there's more now. Um, and this amount of, the total amount of turf across the United States makes it um, the largest agricultural crop in America, which is rather sad when you think about it in terms of the fact that it provides no habitat value. Lawns are costly. You think about all the time it takes you to, for, um, in terms of maintenance, the amount of water they require, and then the fact that most require, or they don't require actually, but are used are fertilizers and pesticides. Lawn, is a carbon source, not a carbon sink. We, what we need these days with climate change are carbon sinks that store carbon. But lawns, because of all the, the, the maintenance uh, required for them, actually puts more carbon into the atmosphere than it, it, what little roots can store for them. Um, When you compare lawn to native plants, lawns cannot filtrate or cleanse uh, water to the degree that native plants do in the soil. They sequester far less atmospheric carbon, um, again, um, and less moisture is transpired by lawn than by larger native plants, which means it affects how much moisture is going into the water cycle atmospherically. And again, they provide um, little food and absolutely no shelter for wildlife. The only food you might think of that, that is possibly provided are the grubs that birds will go after in the grass if they sense that they're there. So the carbon put footprint of turf grass is really high. And so it's another reason that you can use to justify deleting it or or minimizing the amount of lawn that you actually have. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but I can, you can see from the notes here that they really have a negative impact environmentally. So over Calif throughout California, it's estimated that urban areas, uh, the landscape alone consumes 70% of the household water use. So when you read a meter and you see how much water has been used, chances are most of that has been used for your landscaping. But of that water, 70% of that is consumed generally by turf. And because lawns require more water than is supplied by rainfall, I mean, and especially when we look at years like we're having now with drought, that is totally unsustainable. And whether or not it's needed, 10 times more chemical pesticides are used on suburban lawns than our farmland. And, and we know that there are a lot of pesticides used in farmland. But the problem is with those used on, and on turf, most of it winds up going downstream. It gets washed into the water table or our creeks and then the other thing that really makes, I would hope would make people think twice is that if you're using chemicals on your lawn, there has been a link made between those pesticides and cancer among pets and children. You don't wanna be exposing your children, your grandchildren, and I know I don't wanna be exposing my pets and I don't, I don't have lawn any longer, but, and I never did use them. Didn't, didn't see the need to do that. So the solution to this in terms of lawns is pretty simple. If you really feel you need to have a lawn, don't make it any larger than needed. Uh, and think, consider um, using native species. There are sod companies and turf companies who have developed native mixes 
that are deeper rooted, require a lot less uh, water over time and less mowing. And then mowing higher, mowing with electric or uh, battery powered mowers, but please don't be using pesticides or herbicides. So think about changing your, how you deal with it if you do. Uh, the biodiversity, this is a good image to, to just, it really brings it home. I mean, what possible biodiversity could there be in this versus a landscape like this? And this is something that definitely you can create here. Or just doing away with the lawn. There's a whole culture <laughs> embedded in us about lawns and and it used to be a competition among neighbors in terms of I remember growing up my neighbor's dichondralon you know and and oh my if he Mr. Curry was out there making sure he had every weed gone out of there but anyway there are alternatives and kind of getting our heads around the necessity for habitat hopefully you can rethink about what your attraction is for a lawn and rethink that. So prior to European settlement in California in particular, we just had a whole array of vegetative ecosystems um, throughout the state. And why are native plants in particular so special? They have co-evolved with the fungi microorganisms and animals. And they form these complex networks of relationships that are inter inter interdependent on each other. And that, that's why they're the foundation of the, uh, biological diversity, because they are reliant on each other. And they have evolved to provide food and shelter for each other. Re insects rely on particular plants, those plants rely on insects for pollination and other ecological services. So when you think about native plants versus introduced plants, green isn't good enough. And I'm talking in, in reference to introduced species. Plants determine the carrying capacity for wildlife. Introduced plants just aren't set up, they have not evolved to support our native animals through their life cycles like natives do. And their being here decreases that habitat and therefore local species diversity. Native plants are far better at performing the ecological roles that the organisms have evolved with. And in particular, when you think about it, we all know about gut microbiomes, we know about soil microbiomes. Insects have the same relationship with native plants in that those native plants provide the microbiomes that, that the insects need and therefore that rolls on down the line to all the uh, animals that are supported by those the insect populations. Uh, I think of the whole thing with giving uh, feeding bird feeders, hummingbird feeders, and putting sugar out for hummingbirds. I have taken, I used to have one, but I've taken it down because I know my native plants are providing nectar and pollen that is full of microorganisms and nutrients that are not available in that sugar. So they're getting a healthier diet from the native plants in my yard. So the native food food web is, is, it's a much more complex, it's much like if you've taken any of the soils classes where I talk about the soil food web. It's very intricate and it's, it's not just a food uh, triangle in terms of how it works. It's just this very complex net of how things work together. So we all know that photosynthesis, with photosynthesis, plants transform um, sun energy into carbohydrates and, and sh plant sugars. And those are either stored in plants or fed on by animals. And insects actually convert those sugars into proteins and fats, which get transferred 
to animals through mostly being eaten, but when they die and decompose, other animals are taking in those nutrients as well. And these specialized relationships that have developed through uh, evolution are the rule rather than ex the exception. Um, so that's one of the, that's why they're so interdependent on each other. So it should be looked at as, as a food chain, not as a food chain, but as a food web, because it's not, a, it's not linear, it's interconnected. So 90% of our insect herbivores, and that's insects that feed on plants, are diet specialists. They have a special relationship with those plants. And by becoming um, a specialist, those insects have circumvented the defenses that the plant has with everything else, but that insect makes that plant part of its meal, but they never devastate the entire plant. You'll see just holes chewed in them or certain leaves taken off at certain times. And a perfect example of that is the monarch butterfly and its relationship with milkweeds. And why natives make a difference over introduced plants is because that specialization has taken eons for that to develop. It's not something that develops overnight. So the homogeneous palette of uh, introduced plants has, actually, has been part of the reason for the decline in insects that we are observing today. Um, so again, that, and that's why introduced plants don't do a good job of supporting native insects and thereby the insectivores that all feed on them. Uh, the birds, fish, lizards, etc. They don't support pollinators to the same degree. Uh, they don't support uh, local bio biodiversity or stable food web. Um, and they're not, so therefore they're not supporting that ecosystem function. I couldn't, can't stress any more that introduced plants are not the ecological equivalents of native plants that they have replaced. So one of the, the area, one of the areas where we've seen the greatest impacts is in the reduction of caterpillar biomass. And that is what is affecting bird species. All birds, whether they're seed eating birds later in life, rely on caterpillars to feed their young because they're full of protein and fat. And we all know that the native pollinators pollinate roughly 90% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. We need, again, need to rethink about what we see out in the garden and not be so disturbed when we see leaves that have been munched on, especially with native plants. This becomes a point of, in the people I know in the Native Plant Society, this becomes actually a point of celebration. It's like, oh, yay, I, I, I see that I've got butterfly larvae on, on my plant and they're eating it and that's what they're supposed to do, as opposed to looking at that and thinking you've got to get your pesticides out. So there are far more pollinator types than just butterflies and bees. Our pollinators include um, bats, birds and beetles, and other insects as well, uh, wasps, uh, flies, all of that. In one of his books, Doug Tallamy likens um, the ecosystem to a well-oiled machine, machine that operates best with all of its parts, which perform different functions. But with introduced plants, that's like throwing a monkey wrench into a system. It's adding a new part that doesn't belong there. And the system isn't going to work well with something thrown into it that is intended not to be there. Again, getting back to birds, um, the less resources that they have, the fewer eggs they lay, the longer it takes for chicks to mature if they even live to adulthood. Uh, 
there have been, again, deep declines in uh, bird species documented and, and observed that 75 to 96% of the species um, are, are being documented as declining. And that's all attributed to habitat loss. So if we can restore the insects, we can restore the loss. And I hadn't even thought about it till now, but one of the things that native plants do is help us become better insect farmers um, because it helps support all those populations. So in particular, the habitat required uh, for nesting sites for poll pollinators, because when you think about the activities involved in agriculture or development of homes, everything on the ground is disturbed. It's bulldozed, it's, it's replaced with concrete. But 70% of our native bees nest underground and so they need that bare ground for habitat and for, for reproducing. Also, our native plants support populations of natural predators and those help keep pests under control. And so as those species decline, we see that, and especially in more urban gardens, tons of pests, and that I think that's one of the reasons people feel so inclined to use pesticides is because they don't know how to deal with that. They don't have the kind of plants in their yards that help grow populations of natural predators that then keep the pests under control. Insects also help decompose dead plants and those, uh, and, and then whether it's the plants decomposing or the insects decomposing, they provide uh, nutrients in the soil as they break down. They sequester enormous amounts of carbon just within their bodies. And then again, as they die, decay and are absorbed by other insects, that, that is just a carbon transfer. And really, when you think about it, most insects are harmless and they are actually beneficial. So learn, take a different attitude and learn to live with them. And the berries that many plants produce are also really critical for bird populations. And that's because they contain a higher fat content than intro most introduced species. And that is really required, especially um, by adult birds and those that, especially the ones that migrate. You'll oftentimes see the you know, birds fattening up on the berries and then they migrate or overwinter, but they have stored up the fat in their bodies through eating both insects and berries. Wendell Berry has said that there is in fact no distinction between the fate of the land and the fate of the people. Where one is abused, the other suffers. And just think about that in terms of what you've heard so far. So in building your own homegrown habit, habitat, please consider shrinking your lawn because every square foot of lawn that you have is area that is degrading your ecosystem in your own, on your own property. Uh, whether you do it by half or as much as you possibly can to meet your needs. Think of it as an area rug, not wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Um, thankfully, with new legislation and watering, uh, having to do with water use in California, new homes are not even allowed to do that. Um, pretty much the lawns in new homes um, are pretty minimal. And remove invasive species in your own yard. Um, those really impact because they're constantly out competing na not only natives, but other more beneficial plants. In considering how to build homegrown habitat and getting the most bang for your buck, one of the things you want to do is focus on first keystone species because they are a powerhouse in terms of the services that they provide to the greater num greatest number of uh, animals. And be generous with your plantings to the degree you can. 
I say that knowing that we're also live in a very fire prone area. So you still need to balance things out, but to the degree you can, um, increasing the number of these keystone species will be helpful. And I'll be talking more about what a keystone species is. Um, consider planting for specialist pollinators. Um, planting a wide variety, a wide diversity is the key. Uh, fortunately, a lot of the natives are very attractive to a wide variety already. And then you'll find specialists who particularly depend on certain species. And if you have like-minded neighbors and you can get them using natives as well, it, you can see how it goes from a small patch to a larger patch and provides more benefits yet. And this is a, and I hope I can get this to play. Oh, yes, I can. This is a video I took in my own backyard. And this is a bumblebee moth. I had never ever seen a bumblebee moth. And they're related to hummingbird moths, except they're about a third the size. And it's visiting the coyote mint. You can see, look at his antennae. You can see this is not a bee, but it looks like a bumblebee. And it's about the same size as your average good sized bumblebee. That was one of the big thrills that I found uh, two years ago as I had just put these in. They, whoops, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, there are special fairy moths in this county, especially over in the Pine Hill uh, region, that if you plant certain types of natives, they will come. So in building that up, I mean, it's just one of the things that I would challenge you all, put a coyote mint or two in your, in your yard and see if you don't get these bumblebee moths coming. Providing a water feature in your yard really helps draw wildlife and support them. It can be as simple as a bird bath and particularly if it has moving water, it's more attractive and it keeps the water fresher. Uh, it doesn't stagnate. Um, birds love bathing and drinking from water features. The one on the right is my own pond and the waterfall. And I just get such a thrill every morning and evening at watching birds come to visit and bathe in the waterfall. Um, bee hotels can help support uh, populations. The other 30% of our pollinators are bee pollinators actually um, nest above ground and in, generally in holes uh, in wood or in crevices in wood for the most part. But what you don't wanna be providing are these huge monstrosities of bee hotels. Those become a place that makes them more susceptible to disease and parasites. So instead, consider using smaller containers or smaller hotels and put up in various locations um, dispersed through your yard, the, that will provide healthy habitat, whereas going for these larger hotels is not. Create caterpillar pupation sites. We've talked about how important caterpillars are for um, baby birds. And so one of the things that I know, again, people think to be obsessed with doing is raking up leaves all the time. But more than 90% of caterpillars develop um, under the duff on the ground. So when you're raking those up, you're helping destroy that population of those future bird food. Or, and then of course, many of them do make to, to adulthood so that they can reproduce and provide more. So rethink um, if you're raking up all of your leaves. I also teach uh, one of the fire resiliency classes and people are always asking, but, but the leaves. Yes, you don't, wanna, you don't want your leaves, especially in the area five feet around your home, you need to keep those cleaned up. However, beyond that, you want, it's fine because when you think about it, most of the leaves fall in the fall and with the rains, they start to decompose. Usually by spring, you don't have a lot of leaves left 
And by the time we get into fire season, there's even less. So what you don't want to do is leave big piles or deep amounts of leaves on your property, but you do want some. I personally, I've got a very large oak right off my deck. I blow most of my leaves under that. This time of year, you can hardly tell there were any leaves there because they've all already decomposed into the soil. Uh, but I don't have other plants to make it a fire danger. Lawns are not, again, lawns don't provide this service because of all the frequent mowing and most people keep the leaves raked up off of, off of the lawns. So there's no opportunity for them to pupate there. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about keystone species. So 14% of the plants in, the, in our state provide roughly 90% of an insect's food. And keystones really help keep that food web um, healthy. Um, these are the native oaks in our area, in our county, uh, El Dorado County. Now, if you hear from other areas, we'll talk a little more about that. But I have all five of these on my property growing naturally. I've got five acres. I'm over in Cool. And so I'm lucky enough to have uh, this wide variety of these species that support a lot of wildlife. Uh, native wild cherries, tremendous for in terms of both the, the bloom supporting uh, pollinators and then the berries support the birds. These make good hedges. If they're out further away, um, you need to keep them probably 30 feet or more beyond your home in terms of the size for fire safety, but excellent pollinators uh, habitat. Willows are especially known for being uh, fabulous insectaries where uh, insects lay their eggs, feed on the pollen. Although we don't normally look at, look at willows as being flowering shrubs, obviously every plant flowers in some way. So this does provide uh, food for, for various pollinators. And then these are particularly good to put out around um, in any place that you have a wetter area. Willows are adapted to wetter sites. They need their feet wet, so to speak. Um, and so whether you create a bog garden with a willow or you plant them in any creek areas you might have, this will help with um, creating more habitat as well or enhancing it. In our area, uh, Keystone herbaceous species include lupin, and we have many varieties of lupin available. Uh, the sagewort, Artemisia douglasiana, douglasiana, but again, that's a species you want to keep out uh, beyond 30 feet from your home because it does tend to be woody, and you every couple of years you probably should prune that back, just as you should with the coyote bush. Uh, Senecio can be a little closer in towards the home, but its blooms and its habit, again, provide really good uh, habitat. Goldenrod, rabbit bush, uh, deer vetch, and wild strawberries are other keystone species that are native to our area. So in order to find um, really good lists of these species, in particular, the National Wildlife Federation's native plant finder, you just plug in your address and it'll give you a list of the species in our area. And then the CalScape at calscape.org is also a really fabulous resource. And I'm gonna walk you through a little bit on how to use that. So when you go to CalScape, this is what will come up. And what you wanna do is go up here to the upper right hand corner and you'll see advanced search. And so click on that and then it'll come to this page and where it says California, type in your either your address or the town you live in or closest to. And then there's a whole variety of selections that you can make with regard to the type of form you're looking for. Do you need it for a shady spot? Is it full sun? Do you, want your, do you want your yard to be very low water? Uh, do you want to not have to water at all? 
or do you want to incorporate natives into a garden that's already being irrigated, but you just you want to be able to start adding something in terms of natives. Um, this will allow you to select for that. All these other, you know, use the various uses in terms of types of gardening. Uh, a lot of people really want to benefit the pollinators or birds, butterflies, etc. cetera. Uh, deer resistance may be of particular interest to you if you don't have seven high foot fencing. Um, flower color, if that's important to you, you can select from among that. So once you have your selections made, and in this particular case, I, uh, you can see I was looking for plants that would be a shrub that needed, that could take full sun. Most of the drainage around here is pretty good uh, with extremely low water and would be attractive to pollinators. And it came up with these two selections which are both excellent choices um, in our area. Now, if on the other hand, you wanna find plants that are good for part shade uh, and you want to provide moderate to high water for those with irrigation, you're gonna get a whole lot more selection in terms of what it provides to you. So this is got 28 hits on this one. So then if you click on one of those, and in this particular case, I clicked on the Cornusa, uh, Cornus sericea or Creek Dogwood. So it brings up a page about that plant and shows you where it's native to. And then down below that, it'll provide all kinds of information. Some of it is for, for plant nerds, but you see kind of what the form is. Uh, it's deciduous. There is a slight fragrance. It tells you what the flower colors uh, will be. In particular, it will show you all the various insects that are supported by that plant. And in the particular, this particular case, you can see that it's it's um, supports thir it's thirteen species are confirmed and twenty nine are are suspected. It also goes into more detailed information in terms, and you can check out the sunset zone, make sure it grows in your area. Although if it picks it out of that selection to begin with, it should be suited to your area. Whoops. Um, and then the, also, if you'll notice that, that there's a, uh, the companion plants that are usually found with it in natural habitat areas are also listed because you may want to be looking to kind of do something where you want something that'll grow with it. And if you want to expand on that, having this list of companion plants can be very helpful. On our local uh, Native Plant Society page, the El Dorado chapter, you'll find uh, if you go to the gardening tab and drop down, and I did a screenshot of this, I couldn't, and, and then you will see all these other options in terms of how to garden with natives for various needs and various considerations. We provide this plant list is available on the page as well, on the Native Plant Society page um, locally. And this was developed by the horticulture specialists um, on the board. And so it's a really great plant list um, to use for a reference. And many of these plants on this list are keystone species. So within your own, own homegrown habitat, besides plants, you want to be looking at other aspects that help uh, with the insect populations and in terms of providing habitat in particular, uh, leaving logs out on your property or some dead wood can be very beneficial to insects, especially in their um, early stages of life. Decorative boulders provide pupation sites. They also provide sites for lizards to hide. And salamanders and the very small snakes we find, um, the racers and little tiny guys that are out there um, in the landscape. 
we've talked about, I've talked about leaving the leaves um, because they're so necessary for pupating um, caterpillars. And this is down here, you can kind of down on the lower uh, right in on this photo, you can see how tiny, how easy it would be to miss this stuff. You might go out there and go, well, I don't see anything. It's because they're very, very tiny. So where you can leave some natural leaf litter, litter do. This is just an example and not necessarily a, a local example, but we do have same species. We have Sierra tree frogs um, instead of these. We do have ring neck snakes and the little ones that are just, I mean, they almost look like enhanced worms, but you know, they're not a worm because they're much larger uh, and all various types of um, native bees and moths. The other thing you need to do is, is change. If you apply fertilizers regularly or you use herbicides, stop doing that, particularly pesticides. Um, that runs totally contrary to our goals in doing um, native habitat. Artificially fertilize the soils where soils come in. I'm going to wait. Okay, so I saw that my power went down again. So anyway, in terms of native plants are adapted to our low nitrogen soils. So it's not something you really need to worry about. They adapt to this and they will grow just fine. You do need to do some initial watering the first year. Uh, more so taper off the second year. And from there on, if you just want to have pretty much a no irrigation or just once in a while supply water, you'll be successful in getting them established. Uh, but artificially fertilized soils using chemical fertilizers not only um, makes the plants more prone to pests and deer, because what you're doing is providing this sweet new growth um, they particularly like, but you're also impacting the soil uh, food web as well. You're just, it actually destroys the organisms in the soil. So they're not able to do their job and it, it impacts the population or the density of mycorrhizae in the soil. So really you want to avoid fertilizing, if you're going to, you feel like your plants or you want to continue building your soil, putting down uh, compost helps build that soil, which in, in increasing the soil biology naturally feeds your plants. And the other thing with using synthet synthetic fertilizers, it's the majority of them actually get washed out into beyond your yard into our waterways or our aquifers. While in the normal landscape soils, you know, we want rich organic uh, matter in our soils. When you're using native plants, even though I built my soils up because I was doing both my edible garden and then my soils are pretty, even though I have what are considered silty loam soils, they're pretty dense and compacted. So I did go ahead and put down compost, got it rototilled in before I ever started planting. The natives I have there are doing just fine. So it's sort of a choice you have. One of the reasons my garden took off so well in that first two, that's only two years old is because I did do my, I believe it's because I did do the soil preparation, but it doesn't mean you have to do that. Um, if you, are somebody who wants to use outdoor lights, use motion sensored lights because thousands of moths are killed by being attracted to lights that are on all night long. They just beat out their lives trying to do whatever it is that moths are, I don't know why moths are attracted to lights, but it's not a benefit to them. If you um, are have a mower and, and especially I, I mow I mow my pastures, I mow the native grass areas out beyond my yard. Set your mower a little higher um, to avoid killing snakes and lizards. Um, depending on how passionate you are about using uh, 
about natives, consider getting involved in uh, our local organizations, Master Gardeners, Native Plant Society, um, in terms of lobbying others for making changes. One of the cool things I think that's happening is where we used to where we for quite a number of years had school gardens in terms of parents and volunteers helping build vegetable gardens at schools. We're also seeing this same movement to do native gardens at schools. That's a great, um, and those are permanent as opposed to vegetables coming up in the summertime when nobody's around on the school grounds during the summer. So it's a good place to put your time and energy if you wanna do something like this. Uh, if you or in an area where you've got an HOA uh, helping to encourage your HOA to develop more progressive standards uh, that allow for natives can be helpful as well. So are you gonna be a baler or a dumper? You know, in terms of trying to repair this situation, trying to do something about this situation uh, in terms of what's happening with habitat and wildlife, um, the way you decide to move forward will either help or harm in terms of the choices you make. Um, your choices of plants in your yard will determine which role you've taken. So with that, um, we take questions and answers. There are these resources with El Dorado County Master Gardeners, um, the phone number and the email address. Uh, for asking questions or looking for assistance uh, on how to resolve something. And with that, we can now take questions. Hi, Kit. Uh, there's been no questions in the chat room. Oh, wow. Okay. That's okay. Last time I had like 30 questions. Um, well, hopefully, if we if I'm speaking to master gardeners, many of them hopefully have a lot of this background already, and it's sort of preaching to the choir, so to speak. But uh, we can hang around. Oh, we do have one. We do ah, have one question. Oh, good. Can you address Can you address the importance of using local natives? Yes. Um, so I have observed particularly one thing. Uh, let's just take Ceanothus, for instance. Everybody loves flowering, you know, the wild lilacs. And but the deer, <laughs> if you put them in an area where you don't have seven foot high fencing, a lot of people, the deer will munch those right down. And what I've observed is that that does not happen with the Ceanothuses that are native to our specific area. It's very tempting because of habit and color and size and all the rest, because that is one species, one genera, or yeah, that in particular that has a lot of variety throughout the state, that when you bring in plants that are, that are native to the coast, it's like dessert showing up here. Um, there, se there seems to be a whole different <laughs> um, energy about the deer being really like, oh my gosh, I've got to have all of that. <laughs> instead of just a little bit of it, like they do with most of our, our local natives. The other risk that you come, in, come into is that if we have species that are particularly more on the edge in terms of less common, what, what the specialists at CNPS don't want to see happen is bringing in other species that compromise the genetics of our local populations. Um, I can think of the Pine Hill uh, Preserve, for instance, there's a very specialized form of Fremontodendron that is unique to that site. So you wouldn't want, you know, in that case, they would never bring in to that site a standard Fremontodendron because that could affect the genetics of that population there. Um, I can't think of anything specifically, but again, the more you focus on the local natives, the more you're going to appeal to the local uh, fauna in our area. So hope that hope that answered your question. Uh, there, 
there's another question that's popping up. How do I find out what is in my yard and what I should consider removing? I think, um, okay, so there are some great plant apps out there. And in particular, Seek is a free app uh, that is supported by iNaturalists, can help you identify plants. Um, there are others out there as well. I would look at the ratings of them. Uh, I use, is it picture this? I think I'd have to look at my, Excuse me one moment. Yeah, because uh, in discovering, one of the wonderful things I have found in doing, I've taken about three quarters acre of my own property, fenced it, and, and been working it, uh, not only doing my edible garden, but everything else is in natives. One of the things I've discovered is that I have a lot of different stuff coming up, and because much of... Uh, especially under my fruit trees that are irrigated, it's not there and they end up being natives, but they're not natives you would normally see because normally water isn't there. But it's interesting how once they started watering these areas, all of a sudden natives that prefer water are popping up. Things like pineapple weed, uh, red maids, I'm trying to think what else just off the top of my head. Um, just different species, which has been a delight. But um, yeah, so the other app, and I do pay for it, is called Picture This. There are other apps out there as well uh, that you can uh, try to utilize. I believe there's also a way to put photos into Google and they Google will come up with uh, potential IDs. You just have to really kind of look very carefully to make sure that the plant they're matching with your request to ID actually looks the same. Oftentimes it's not unusual that they're not, they don't get it right. Um, so that's one way to do that. Um, you can send pictures to the master gardeners, I'm sure. Okay, we have a home, I, so there's two pages. I have a homegrown habitat page for specifically El Dorado County. You can post pictures there to ask for identifications. Uh, we'll let you know whether it's not a, whether or not it's a native, but we'll also tell you what it is. Uh, there's lots of ideas that get shared. People ask questions about what you know. What can I plant here? You'll get a lot of feedback and ideas if you don't use the Calscape app um, to find particular plants yourself. You can get ideas from other people and feedback um, in that form. Okay, we, we have another question about where can you purchase natives in El Dorado County or close by? Okay, well, so as, as the horticulture chair for our chapter, I also coordinate our plant sales twice a year, um, generally April and October. And we have been getting a really nice variety of natives that are, and I really try to focus on natives that are specific for our area. I go a little bit out on the fringes if it grows in the Sierras or, and the lower foothills. Um, otherwise also uh, the Sac Valley chapter, Sacramento Valley chapter has their own nursery at Elderberry Farms uh, down in Elk Grove. They have a fabulous nursery. It's not open to the public, but you can order online. They have plant sales as well. I think hopefully after uh, we get really through COVID, they may be opening to the public again. Um, I, I've noticed and I've seen the feedback from other people that Green Acres Nursery is stepping up their native um, plant section. So you may uh, have success in finding natives um, at some of the local bigger box stores. I really can't speak, again, you need to really watch for plants that are, have been treated with herbicides excuse me, pesticides. Um, you don't want anything with neonic, neonicotinoids, neonics for short, um, because you don't wanna bring, be bringing those home to your garden. They'll kill any insect that feeds on it, including the pollen and the flowers. So just that's one of the reasons to avoid those big box stores um, like Home Depot and that. They're, they're, 
unfortunately known for doing that. They, they committed to, to reducing that, but I just, you just need to, you need to ask the question. So hopefully that helped. I don't, uh, some of the local, I, I don't know. I know some of our local nurseries have closed. There's the golden gecko in uh, garden Valley over towards shingle Springs. There used to be a good nursery, but I, I don't, I think that they went out of business. So I'm not sure what's kind of over on the 50 corridor. Hit, this is Tracy. I'm just going to pop in and say they are still, the, the one off of Duroc Road is still there. And then there's a brand new nursery in Placerville that is, um, oh, I think that's Ray Lawyer Drive by the Boys and Girls Club. So there's a few uh -huh. off still locally. Oh, what, what is, do you know the name of the one off in Placerville, the new one? The new one in Placerville is called The Meadow. Oh, okay, cool. Yep. Yep. And they carry, are they carrying uh, natives that you know of? You know, I've seen a few and some pollinator plants. And I think if we, you know, the locals ask for more natives that they'll be happy to get them. Okay, great. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's across the street from the Gino Body Shop. It's where the uh, Carter's Garden and Pets used to be. Oh, okay, great. It's that same. Yep, yep. Thank you. We have a, oops, let me get, we have another question. How do you, how do you determine if plants have been treated with neonics? There should be a tag. They, they should be disclosing it. it. Just like anything else, they're supposed to disclose all that stuff. But asking, you know, asking staff or asking the nursery manager uh, doesn't hurt. Okay, that's all the questions that were in the chat room. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here today and spending your time with us. Thank you so much, Kit, for your insight. And I know I, for one, have some things that I can do better in my home to take care of uh, the wildlife and, and the planet. So um, we appreciate all of you for joining us today. All of these materials will be posted on our website after the class, and probably it'll be up by Tuesday. So thanks so much. Enjoy your weekend. Stay cool and um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Kit. Uh -huh. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Pam. Yes, thank you all. Thank you so much for all your support. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good day, everybody.